Today on Engine Power, from two decades in storage to the dyno, the heart of original Bigfoot restoration is completed. Welcome to Engine Power and the show most of you have been waiting for. Today is final assembly and dyno of the original Bigfoot One's power plant. Our goal is simple, to make an engine that makes big power, that's reliable, but most importantly, retains the aesthetic so it looks the same as it did back in the 80s. Here's a quick look at what got us to this point. Why don't we just quit talking and go to work? Have at it. Mike and I took delivery of the original 640 cubic inch Allen Root Big Block Ford with simple directions. Don't hurt it. So we disassembled it, taking notes and learning about the technology that was used 30 years ago. Then we enlisted the best Ford engine builder on the planet, John Kazi, to do the machine work and get us ready for assembly. If you're new to this project, the foundation is this Ford Racing aluminum big block designed by Allen Root. Now it shares the same characteristics as Ford's 385 series engines, which was their 429 and 460 big block. It has a 4.377 inch bore with the freshly installed sleeves from Kazi. Now they're a little smaller than original, but we gain tons of rigidity in the block structure due to the thicker walled sleeves and that smaller bore. Billet aluminum four bolt main caps will keep the crank in place and they have to be removed for us to get started. Going in the saddles are Cleavite P-Series bearings. Making sure the saddles and the bearings are as clean as possible using a lint-free paper towel is crucial. Here's a quick tip. Never use red shop towels to clean engine parts when assembling. They're cotton based and shed red lint which can wreak havoc in a fresh engine. Out back, the upper half of the Felpro rear main seal is laid in. Same with the bottom half. This 90 plus pound forged billet steel crank has a 4750 stroke and is internally balanced. It's made specially for this engine and can take any punishment we're going to throw at it. Now the main caps can be filled with the other halves of the bearings and then placed over the main studs. A rubber mallet is then used to seat the caps in the registers. With extreme pressure lube placed on the nuts and washers, We'll snug all the caps and only torque the center one, which houses the thrust bearing. Now, using a magnetic base and dial indicator, we'll check the crank's thrust, which is how much the crank can move front to back. We're looking for four to nine thousandths. It's six thousandths, so we can go ahead and torque the rest of the caps. First 30, then 55, and the final 85. Next up is the time-consuming task of file fitting the rings. Now here's a quick tip. Start by filing the second compression rings first. Now it sounds strange, but here's the logic behind it. It gives you a chance to get a feel for what you're doing. The second gap is crucial, but not as critical as the top rings. Now we're doing the second and first rings at 7 thousandths per inch of bore, which will put us in the 30 thousandths range. Custom engines require custom pistons, and for that we went to one of the best in the business, CP Pistons. They built us a forged aluminum flat top with dual valve reliefs, and these are the same forgings that they use in alcohol funny cars and dragsters. We started by sending them a sample from the old engine. They redesigned it to meet the needs of our updates and the increase in power we're going to see. They retain the original 1031 pin diameter, and those are held in by double spiral locks instead of the old aluminum buttons. They have ultra precise ring grooves and they're set up for a 16th, 16th, 316th ring pack. The oil ring is supported in the pin boss by a support rail to eliminate any oil control issues. Plus, it's still a full slipper skirt design with a super smooth finish to reduce friction. When you have a good thing, why change it? Now we're going to hang those new pistons on the original Crower rods. Now these things are a forged steel I-beam design and have a 7150 center to center length. Now they'll support in excess of 1500 horsepower, which is way more than we'll ever need. The pins are lubed up and will make the link between the rod and the piston. Now making sure they stay put are double spiral locks. Now the only thing we can say about them is take your time as you roll them in place. To complete the piston and rod assemblies are the custom total seal rings. First to go on the piston is the oil support rail which has a dimple in the surface to keep the end gap from rotating into the pin boss. 
The 3 16 oil ring has chrome faced rails for durability and the expander is a standard tension for supercharged applications. The steel Napier second ring is next. A Napier ring has a sharp hook on the edge to actively scrape oil off the cylinder wall. Finally, the C33 steel top ring. Now these complement the super accurate ring grooves by maintaining a flatness of less than 50 millionths of an inch. With the rings in place, we'll use Royal Purple break-in oil to lube the pistons. Now the Clevite rod bearings can go in, get lubed, and using Royal Purple break-in oil, the cylinders are lubed as well. Our Total Seal tapered ring compressor will allow the number one assembly to slide into its new home. With extreme pressure lube on the nuts, we can tighten the rod cap into place. The same procedure is done for all eight cylinders and requires a little bit of patience. All right, Pat, last one, number right. eight. Home stretch. Nice. Now the rods can be torqued to 65 foot-pounds. And with that, we have a short block, which gets us one step closer to the dyno. Big cubic inch engines require special specifications, and there are no secrets here. Now the guys over at Comp Cams designed this bump stick, which controls the opening and closing of the valves to maximize that engine's capabilities. Due to the stout spring pressure we'll be running, we're using Comp's cam lube on the journals and the lobes. Duration at 50 thousandths is 277 on the intake, 289 on the exhaust. Lobe separation angle is 113 and gross valve lift is 824 and 800 respectively. On its snout is a cam thrust plate just like a 429 and 460 engine use. And in front of it is the hub for this engine's gear drive. Now here's where the photos we took during disassembly come in handy. We have to make the link from the cam to the crank, so using the original gears, those picks assured us it's going back together the same way. Degreeing the cam is assurance the camshaft is operating the valves at the precise times it should be. Our cam card states it should be installed at 113 degrees, and we verified that, so there are no questions. Big engines need big flowing cylinder heads to make good power, and that's just what these Allen Root aluminum Hemi style heads will give us. Now these things saw a lot of abuse in that monster truck over the years, but the little trip they took down to Kazi racing engines got them back in order. Here's a look at the treatment they received. The intake runner's roof was way thinner than Kazi liked, so he had his guys add more material in the rocker stand's pad, then they machined it back down, making this area a whole lot stronger. They also received new valve guides, and they replaced the epoxy on the push rod holes since the original stuff was flaking and peeling off. A competition valve job was also performed, which will help the head flow better numbers. To get them in working order, we called Manly, who set us up with all the components to get them put together, like seals, locks, wear caps, retainers, and spring cups. They also sent us their signature custom Gen 2 Severe Duty intake and exhaust valves. Now the NK844 material used in the intake valves and the XH428 material used in the exhaust valves are not available by anyone else in the world. Now that makes these things up to four times stronger than anyone else's offerings. Now sizes are 2400 on the intake, 1900 on the exhaust. The valve springs are their Nextech double spring design that doesn't use a dampener. Now diameter is an inch 640. First to go on is the ID locator spring cup, followed by the Viton valve stem seal. Now the stem of the valve gets lubed with Max Tough assembly lube and slid into place, making sure to rotate the valve so the lube coats the entire guide and seal. Now the spring is put into position and topped with a titanium retainer. Using the Goodson spring compressor to compress the assembly will allow the valve locks to be put in. With the others completed, the heads will be ready to go on. For gaskets, we wanted the best we could get our hands on, so we sent all the originals from this engine to Cometic Gaskets. They used their in-house tooling to remake all of them using the latest in high-tech materials. The head gaskets are made of copper and have a 4385 bore and a compressed thickness of 43 thousandths. VHT's copper gasket cement 
We'll coat the top and bottom to ensure we don't have any leaks around the water jackets. This is a must for single layer copper gaskets. With them in place, we can position our head over the 9 16th studs and guide them to the deck. With extreme pressure lube on the nuts, we'll torque the head in stages till we reach 110 foot pounds. Here we go. Which requires an anchor man, literally. <laughs> Victory. Whew. Now it's starting to look like an engine. <laughs> yes, it is. Coming up, the build continues. We're back and have made good progress in the resurrection of Bigfoot's original engine. From the crank, pistons, heads, and cam. Now, rotting on those lobes are Comp's Endurex mechanical roller lifters equipped with a vertical link bar. They're fully heat treated, machined to ultra high tolerances, and are even rebuildable. We inspected the push rods and gave them the green light. With lube on the tips, the rocker assemblies can go on in the engine's firing order. The intake rocker stand is first, which is secured with a countersunk bolt in the center. And with the outer fastener to align it, we'll torque it to 25 foot pounds. Now the wear cap can go on the valve tip and get lubed. The rocker shaft assembly drops down now and the shaft is pushed into the stand. Kazi added a third fastener for additional strength which goes through the shaft and the stand. This spreads the load out across the entire assembly making it stronger. We'll set the intake's cold lash to 10 thousandths since this is an aluminum block and head configuration. Now place a lash cap on the exhaust valve as well. These stands only use two fasteners. Now the arm is uncharacteristically long due to the exhaust port's location. We'll set the lash to 12 thousandths. And of course, there are seven more cylinders to go. In order to install a timing cover, we had to have the Magneto drive gear and housing. Well, luckily it just got back from System 1 Pro Ignition where they custom fit this MSD Pro Mag 12 into the original Allen root housing that had a vertex in it. To do it, they had to replace the lower housing and this shaft for a new number four unit inside the MSD. Now the reluctor was also reclocked to work with the counterclockwise direction of the MSD setup. They also installed a new Mallory four pin driver and lockout. Here's what the old one looked like. They even glass beaded the housing for us and supplied a new band clamp to mate the two together, making this the go-to source for any mag work. Now we can install the mag drive gear, which rides on a captured bearing in the block, and pre-lube the entire drive with Comp Cam's valve train spray. Now we'll run a bead of gray RTV silicone on the timing cover's mating surface. Finally, the timing cover can be reunited with its counterpart, and the blower's tensioner bracket can be installed, which houses the fasteners for the cover. Now the timing wheel can be installed onto the crank snout followed by the alternator pulley, and finally, the blower drive pulley. The Allen root mag housing can go on now, which leads us underneath to mount the oil pan. With a one-piece gasket in place, the original dually oil pan can go on to seal up the bottom end. Back up top, we'll dress the head side of the chromatic intake gaskets with Loctite high-tack sealant. Lay them down and apply silicone to the china rails for a leak-free seal. One more thing. Beautiful. That's only important to us. Nice, nice, nice. Hey, you would too. Finally, the mammoth blower manifold can go on and is tightened in a crisscross fashion to 35 foot pounds. Slicking up the springs, trunnions, and roller tips is Comp's valve train assembly lube. And to seal all this up are more chromatics, which are sandwiched by the original cast aluminum valve covers. Another component we had to send out to get rebuilt is this external oil pump from Aviade. Now they replaced the relief valve and a bearing or two, but other than that it was in really good shape. And they got it back to us within a week. Thanks Aviade. It attaches to the mag housing and is driven by a hex off the gear. Blower Drive Service or BDS serviced this old Mooneyham 871. Now that included replacing the blower drive hub, all the bearings, and inside they replaced the seals. Now BDS also sent us the correct length blower belt for our pulley combination. This rubber coupler makes the link from the crank to the crank driven Mylodon water pump. All new Earl's fittings and hoses dress the engine's cooling system. Now, 
Now a gasket and the blower. Now, or I mean the nitrous Hold on, we, we have all this, uh, we have a picture of that somewhere. And again, the documentation rules. Nitrous plate was the highest. It goes gasket, hold down bracket for the blower, and then the spacer, then the nitrous plate, then the top end. <laughs> I can't wait to hear this thing run. I cannot wait. That's gonna be awesome. And that's the plan after the break. You've waited for it, so stay with us. We knew you'd wait for this moment. After all, this engine waited 23 years for it. We've put a large amount of time into this restoration, along with Summit Racing, who saw its historic value as well. 23 years since exhaust cooked these headers. Water rushed through its cavities. Fuel and spark exploded in its chambers. The refurbished MSD Magneto will generate the spark carried through their 8.5 millimeter wires to V-Power racing plugs gapped at 12 thousandths. The fuel is fed through the three original Predator carburetors, refurbished as well by the same company that made them in the early 70s. Wide opens right there. In fact, everything is original, except a short list of internals. With oil being pressurized in the block and the fuel line connected, the 23 years of silence is about to end. Ready? Contact, clear prop. Nice! We had faith it would run, but that quick fire up was a surprise. Idle and a little high. So after setting the timing at a safe 26 degrees, we'll shut it down. You know what? Woo, that was a fire up. That was, that was a fire up right there. Nice. Celebrate again and adjust the Predator's linkage. We also noticed the air fuel ratio was too rich, so each carb needed a slight but equal tweak to the recessed adjustment screws. A lot of teamwork involved in this. And we'll try again, <laughs> this time to warm it up for a final inspection. There, now we're talking, now it idles. After 10 minutes on 116 octane, we can confirm the valve lash settings. With no leaks, no knocks, and no flames, we'll make a conservative pull from two to 4,000 RPM. Ready? All right, on to glory. Bad. Hey, that's the, the torque, 777 foot-pounds of torque, 588 horse. We have uh, almost 16 pounds of boost right almost now. 16 pounds and climbing. And climbing. Here goes another at 1,000 more RPM. 750 horsepower, 795 in torque. And big torque is what makes a monster truck a monster. And we're stopping here for good reason. We're not trying to kill it, no. It, is, it needs to motivate the truck, and I think it's gonna do that just fine. With 1,000 more RPM in the sweep, it made an additional 200 horsepower. And at that rate, it'll make 1,000 at 6,500 RPM. But this build wasn't about making max horsepower or max RPM. It's all about getting that power plant back between the frame rails of the original Bigfoot One. From here, it's gonna go next door to Truck Tech where the install's gonna happen, and that gets us one step closer to the driver's seat. Then you may be able to see it on its final tour around the country before it hopefully goes to rest at the Smithsonian.